uh, James Ham of the Insiders uh, with us here, fresh from practice uh, on D-Lo and Casey. James, let's just get right into this. You were in that media scrum. You were trying to get some answers regarding Kevin Herter. We didn't watch the entire eight-minute clip of Mike Brown. It, you got to convince me that Mike does not hate Kevin Herter's guts. He laughed and smiled about everything. We're unclear as to... He was asked if Mike practiced, and he was like, uh, yeah, I didn't see it. I was in a meeting. He's talking about next game up or next game or something like that. Like, what, what is happening? With Kevin? Yes. Uh, Kevin's there. Like, I, I think he's ready to play. Did he have a – so you you noted that Trey Lyles was on the floor with a red jersey. That means no contact, right? Yeah, no contact for both Trey and, very surprising, Devin Carter out on the court shooting in front of us. I was very – like, hang on a second. He's sec. a long way away. He's, He's still months and months away. He won't be reevaluated until January. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about three months from now. So to see him out, like, sort of messing around and shooting. I mean, he's shooting free throws and, like, hanging out. Um, I thought that that was interesting. But uh, I think Kevin Herter is, like, really close to, like, being cleared. Being cleared to he, actually. What did I miss? I thought he was already cleared. He was cleared to go back to full contact. So, so what's the next hurdle then? The next hurdle is getting practices in where you're actually getting full contact. And you have to remember, he got cleared for there's, full so contact. So there's no medical hurdle to clear. He's cleared it. Yeah, well, sort of. Because what the Kings do is they have a ramp up. They have a very specific uh, group of, you know, they want to see you go 1v1 and then 2v2 and 3v3 and 5v5. Mm -hmm. And they want to make sure that you go through all these steps as you're getting cleared to come back. So I think Kevin was pretty clear that like, I think on Saturday he was able to come in and get the one V one workout in. And then he's already got to two V two. I think it, it's even possible. He's been cleared for five V five. So it now it's just a matter of like, when does he understand the role? Like whatever they're asking him to do, he's got to be there for, to start going through the motions of the play sets. And, and again, he's got to keep it continuously, play through contact he has to learn again almost how to how to hit somebody again how to play defense again a little bit because it's been seven months where he's not allowed any contact at all he's been shooting for months but whether or not he's been cleared to do anything else on a basketball court the answer is no he was not now we're just seeing sort of the build up the return to play and and i i see the look but a return to play when somebody rolls an ankle and is out like three weeks and a return to play when somebody has shoulder surgery and is out seven months are two totally different things. I understand, but it's not like Herter has, we saw Herter on the floor with Doug. We saw it with Doug and I think Domas, maybe DeMar in one of those LA videos. Now I don't know what Kevin was doing, but he was there. It's not like Kevin's been, you know, sitting at the house eating uh, chips waiting to get cleared like he clearly has been working he looked phenomenal in the in the in the in the in the video we saw at least in the workout clothes we saw like he look he looks like he's in tremendous shape yeah i i just i guess i just don't understand really what we're talking about especially when now maybe i just don't understand how this process works they had i think he was cleared before the utah game and like not not going out there and playing in the utah game like uh, it, it's okay fine i thought for sure he was going to play last night Oh, he was cleared before the Portland game. He was cleared on the, I think he was cleared Thursday before the second um, game against the Warriors. Oh, but that's to return. That's to for full contact. Okay. So then he, he had the full contact workout like one-on-one. -on -one, and then when they get to Sunday, the problem is that even these, these practices that they're having right now, they're not really practices, right? Like they're, the build up to the regular season. Now from here to next Thursday, they're going to have some light days. They're going to have a couple of days off. They're going to have some just shooting days, but they're also going to have some pretty uh, like rigorous practices. And, and he will be part of whatever the buildup is here. I'm assuming he's going to be fully cleared for five on five uh, and, and to actually, you know, play. But again, once he gets to a point where they're like, okay, we're comfortable. And the medical staff is saying we're comfortable. Um, I, I even think his doctor is going to be involved in this, in the discussion. Like, are you ready? Plus he told us like, he has to figure out what it's like because his left shoulder does not feel like his right shoulder still. 
it at all. So, it's you not know, going to for a while it, 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 and it may never. And, and he said, I have to live, you know, sort of understand that and figure out how to play with it like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is kind of like when someone has a major surgery like this, especially an upper body injury, like I think the concern is like going for rebounds. If he goes mm -hmm. to dunk a ball, uh, going out and, and trying to play defense on the perimeter, you know, trying to close out on the three point shot and whether he feels comfortable or not, you know, so those are the things you're trying to work through right now. I, I would expect that if it's not the regular season, uh, like opener, it'll be within the first week of the season or so that he's, that he's back on the court. And I think that the Kings may have just bought themselves a little bit of time with Doug McDermott, you know, where if you need him to play the role of Kevin Herter, that's kind of who he is. Uh, no, I assume no surprise is with today's cuts of Scal, Terry Taylor. No, I, like, unfortunately, I, I don't think there are any, like, I mean, most of these guys I think are going to Stockton. Uh, well, hmm. I, I, at least they, they're, they're going to have an opportunity. I would think, especially Scal, mm -hmm. who they have is his, uh, G league returning rights. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, they brought in, was it Antoine Davis? Um, Drew Timmy and one other today. Sharif. Oh, Sharif O'Neal. Yeah. They they're signing all those guys today. They will be then waived. And this is a way that they give those guys a little bit of extra money so they can show up and play in the G League. They also with Boogie Ellis, um, I went back through and I've been under the understanding that, that he was not he would have to go through the G League draft. Um, I don't know exactly how much they gave him in guaranteed money, mm -hmm. but he signed an exhibit 10 contract mm -hmm. uh, for the summer. And if if he makes more than a standard exhibit 10, which caps out at seventy five thousand dollars, if he makes more than that, then they can't send him to the G League. If he makes less than that, seventy five or less, then they can actually send him as an affiliate player uh, as long as he's one of the last cuts like he is. So he he can go to the G League without going through the G League draft if he made less than seventy five thousand on his on his training camp invite. Do you, um, so that's, is that r roster cuts? That's it. Are we done? Yeah. I mean, outside of like the guys that got signed today will get cut as well. Well, yeah, that the, 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 the formality part of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't think, I don't think they're going to do anything else as of today. Like they, they still have a, they're going to be a roster 14. spot. Yeah. yeah. They're going to be a 14. So, um, so I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they sign one more guy, like what we've seen. Uh, with like these these little small contracts where mm -hmm. you sign them and then and then waive them so they can go to the G League, um, and I also wouldn't be surprised if they looked at all the other other uh, the other roster cuts around the league, and maybe there's a player that they do like and that they can bring in. Okay. Well, the, that's the formalities of the uh, preseason being over and uh, essentially training camp ending, and getting into. Well, we're getting into preparation now for the Minnesota Timberwolves next week. Um, we, because we're all taking part in it. Um, <laughs> what were the what 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 was this preseason? It's over. Yesterday sucked. Uh, it was just as bad as what we'd seen uh, a couple of nights ago at the Golden One Center. Uh, we heard De'Aaron breaking it down uh, just a couple of minutes ago. Some of the flaws and and uh, what they did over the course of the last five games. Things that need to, need to be better when the games start to count. But like what? What was this? It, it it looked like a bunch of guys that it, honestly, with the exception of Domas and really Doug McDermott, they, the guys who were on the floor yesterday didn't look interested. Yeah, like listening to Mike today, I was I was intrigued. He said that they still didn't run any play sets the entire. He's like, we're just doing our flow offense and saying, hey, can you figure out ways to beat teams mm -hmm. doing the flow offense? Just well, the on emphatic that answer is no. Yeah, probably, um, but. Then they they've been working with all their play sets on top of that, and we might have seen some of their play sets like hidden within the flow offense. Mm -hmm. um, like they clearly the players know what all of the play sets, and there's possibility that they're like, hey, you know, really quickly, let's run this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen a little bit of it, but I think that they've been holding back a whole lot of stuff. And then this last week is going to be okay. Like, how are we going to game plan for game one? This is like sort of, I want you to run flow X amount, like X percentage of the time. 
but then we're going to start filtering in like these play sets. So I, I want to see what you guys look like with this and this. And so I think we're going to start to see more and more of the offense, but I also don't think they want to tip their hands all that much in the preseason. And even if it looked clunky, I think that's okay with them. They, they don't really value the preseason all, as much as like fans do. And you know, the concern people out there looking at this and saying, Hey, this does not look like a good product right now. And that, 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 idea of the offense that you just explained that Mike ran here this preseason, that's probably part of the reason like it looked a little extra clunky when we saw guys like Mason Jones, Kobe Jones, some of those different guys out there because they don't have the experience of just running an offense that doesn't have structure to it. You run a structured offense, like maybe that you call them plays, maybe those guys are are a little bit stronger in that sense. But when you're, hey guys, just go out there and vibe, go out there and flow a little bit. Yeah, maybe not so much. Maybe that's not the strong suit of the Joneses of Mason, Colby, and Isaac. Yeah, I, I mean, I so you want to see those guys play though, and no, for, for sure. But I don't think it's fair to expect them to play the way that maybe Demar and no, of course not. Though those guys would in a in a free flowing form. Mm -hmm. No, I'm with you, and and I that's think... where I felt like things looked the worst. Oh, oh. And, and granted, I know it's a different caliber of player. But also at the same time, you're going against a different caliber of player. And it felt like the Kings were always kind of short. I, I think when you listen to De'Aaron and, and he brings up the first two games and he's like, you know, we we're leading in the first half when the starters were really playing. And even then they were filtering some of these other guys. Sure, they gave up like 15 threes in the first half to the to the Warriors, but they still led 68, 66. They, they're looking at, OK, we got to figure out the three point thing. But you're also playing without Trey. You're playing without Kevin. You know, even at the the beginning, the first two games, they're playing without uh, Jordan McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. So who's things, turned out to be really good? Yeah, he looks good, doesn't he? He does. He looks really good. He's fun to watch. Hey, and for that matter, like watching Doug uh, McDermott. Uh, like I don't know if you guys listened to him. Like he, we played a little bit of it. Um, it was it was another kind of a length that we, we he gave us his you know his journey from. Yeah, he's like, yeah, no, I flew, physical, tired, went out there and got some shots up. Just like he, he said, yeah, I, I've got to do what I got to do to like get ready, and by that, that means run around and get ready. I did ask him what he was going to wear for Halloween, and then he didn't answer. But as soon as he walked away, he like grabbed me by the shoulder and say, "Hey, I'm going as Kevin Herter," and I thought that that was hilarious. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed watching him play last night. It got to the point where I felt like Kobe in his last game, where I didn't want anybody to shoot the ball except for Doug McDermott. Oh, yeah. I was just like, give him the ball. <laughs> this game sucks. This game. I have no interest in it. I just want to see Doug shoot the ball every time he touches it. Yeah, I know. Even And he almost did. <laughs> last night, I got a little bit of grief online, and then I, I even heard it today by from one of the media relations. Like, hey, you know, you put that... Uh, I, I put out the gif of uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman from Along Came Polly where, let you know, it rain. let it rain. And like, you know, he ended up hitting shots and I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Like I've never watched a dude like get off a plane and take 11 threes in a game five yeah. minutes later. And we're not talking mid season. Oh, this is buddy McDermott out there. Yeah, We're not talking like mid season where a guy gets traded and then has to fill in because there's a bunch of guys who got traded and some guys aren't there and you're trying to figure everything out. No, this dude hadn't went, gone through a training camp ever. Kevin, Kevin Herr is like 14 steps to get cleared to play. Doug McDermott walks off a plane, you know, yep. laces up his sneakers yeah. and like, Hey, play basketball, 11 threes. I got this. Like, all right. <laughs> yeah, I got a little tired. Yeah, I bet you did. I got tired. Like, and I didn't even shoot the ball, man. I bet you did. <laughs> um, let's talk about. Now, nah, let's save this. Let's come back, Jesse. We'll 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 come back because I'm going to ask you a question that I think is going to be uh, a lengthy answer. So we'll come back. James Ham of the Insiders is with us, and everyone knows I'm going to ask you about Keon Ellis, and I'll even give you time to prepare. I need you to make the case that Keon Ellis has earned the starting two position. Uh, so James will do that. I'm sure he feels comfortable doing it. His wife is an attorney. Um, we'll come back. Steelo and Casey, James Ham here on Sacramento Sports Leader, ESPN 1320. <clears throat> Sorry, I know that was a little early. I just 
I know. I know. <laughs> I know. This Dodgers Met series is weird. I did not expect the Mets to have any juice. I think they have nine runs in the series. Wow. One of those games had seven of them, and now they got eight here and four. Man. Oh, man. Shavano McDermott. (laughs) That's funny. Uh, Buddy Heald is almost a year younger than Doug McDermott. If we are to believe Buddy Heald's age. (laughs) Oh, it's just which one? Well, Um, he should be two years younger than Doug McDermott. Doug's 32? He's 32, almost 33. Okay. And Buddy Heald's 31, but 31 in like 300 and something days. Oh, okay. Very good. Hmm. Some great baseball yesterday. Oh, that oh, didn't was look amazing. Like... Yeah. A lot of fun to watch. Being under one of those baseballs coming down is not fun at all. I've never been under one in the outfield, but I've been under one on the side, the the uh, third baseline. It is not fun. I did not enjoy it at all. Like you, you I did not want to catch the ba- baseball with a glove on. No, oh. I didn't have a glove on. Okay, I'm a grown ass man. What am I going to do with a glove at a baseball game? Okay, I don't even own a baseball glove. <laughs> I didn't think you. Owned a I just look. I, it's like, oh, here it comes, and you kind of see people gathering. It's like, oh, that is okay. <laughs> okay and then like i'm not a punk i'm not gonna move but yeah i did i did not enjoy that at all uh that's funny not at all you didn't just like reach up and nope I snatch it out of the air let somebody I, I hand was up but i was like it wasn't like a solid effort to try to catch it more to like shield it from busting my head open i can see you in the stands <laughs> Oh, I did not enjoy it. That's funny. That was that was Jesse's spot. That was Fenway. You were in Fenway mm-hmm. when this happened? Yes, I was oh, in Fenway. Okay, so I've never been to Fenway. I, like I think I was I think I think that I think I was there the night Alex Rodriguez hit six hundred. Oh. I'm pretty sure that was against the the Red Sox. And um yeah, that wasn't the. I would have tried to catch that one. This was just a foul ball. I was like, "Oh God, no, no." <laughs> That's funny. I would love to go to a game, Fenway. I I went to a game in old Yankee Stadium before it was torn down. Never went to the old, but I have been to the new. I haven't been to the new yet. Very nice. I've been in New York in a while. I love New York. Yeah, I did that trip a couple of summers ago. I'd love to do that one again. Mm-hmm. I like to go to New York every couple of years. I actually wanted to go this year during Christmas, but oh, yeah, the King schedule isn't really best suited to go away during Christmas. It never is. And uh, I was like, oh, all right, never mind. What I I love about New York is more than any city that I've ever been to in the in the world is that I think it has something for everyone Mm -hmm. like if you're an outdoor person you want to go for walks and stuff you can go Mm -hmm. to central park and just like wander around for hours Mm -hmm. you want to do high-end shopping it's got the best shopping you want to go to a ball game you want to go get good food or go see a play or go to um like a really cool museum it has everything yeah yeah like every walk every so much of it is walkable Every stage of life, too. Like, you can keep going back and have a different experience. Very much agree. Very much agree. About 40 seconds or so. No, Tyler, I could have. Taken out on a stretcher because I couldn't catch a foul ball. (laughs) 
That guy does not look happy. He's like, look, man, we spotted you an 8-1 lead. Just go out there and get out. Do mm-hmm. not walk people. Do not do stupid stuff. They hit a three-run jack here. All of a sudden, it's 8-5, to five and we got a ball game again. Mm-hmm. All right, back here to close out the week uh, with our man James Ham from the Insiders and fresh from King's practice. Uh, James, with the five preseason games being behind us, obviously not a very successful preseason. Uh, for some, a bit of a frustrating preseason. But I'll ask you, and and I and I and I pose the question, and I don't I don't think I gave a definitive answer to it, but I did ask the question and gave reasons to why I think it's a fair question. But has Keon Ellis done anything to earn the starting two guard spot for the Sacramento Kings? I mean, I think it's a good question, to be honest. Um, I think defensively he's been fine. Uh, he certainly has had way too many fouls. But I kind of look at him and he's playing end of the year basketball where I don't think everyone else is. And so, like, he's cranked up the defensive intensity and trying to play a hard nosed defense. And, and I think he's picked up too many fouls. Um, you know, I, he fouled out of one game. He's had four fouls in another game. Um, overall, like, it's tough because I don't think he's going to be asked to do a lot of scoring throughout the year. And when you look at what he's done in the preseason, I mean, he scored two points in the opener, but then 12 points, 11 points, four points in that debacle in Utah, and then 10 points uh, against the Clippers last night. And, um, uh, you know, again, his three point shooting has been okay. It hasn't been great, but neither has anyone else is on the team. Right. And so what is he four for? I don't know. What is that four for 16? Uh, five, five of 16, 17. Um, so again, that's not great, but it's still like, look at the other numbers that we're going to compare this to. I think he's been okay. And, and I think that, uh, like, again, when the offense is clunky, and it's not working and the sort of your star level players are it's not working out for them the the two guys who are going to pay for that aren't so much those two uh, you know the three big uh guys it's going to be keegan and it's going to be keon How and so it, well because if if the pick and roll isn't working or you know some someone is doing something defensively to stop the kings like stars from doing what they do uh-huh then the ball gets sticky and their guys don't have to sag. And so like the, the ball doesn't move freely. Mm -hmm. And I thought what we saw throughout training camp, I mean, throughout preseason was really like not a lot of ball movement at all. And, you know, the Kings kept getting, you know, I I think against Utah, they had 32 assists, Mm -hmm. which is fine, but that's also, they had like 108 possessions or something. Right. Right, So it it was something like, outlandish how many shots they took in that game they should have had 40 something assists that's how many opportunities they had but even that game i didn't feel like the ball hopped around nearly as much as it should the rest of the the games i I thought that the kings did a lot of their offense with smoke and mirrors a lot of it was fast breaks Uh, a ton of it they scored 32 fast break points in one game 30 fast break points in another and in those games if you're finishing with like 25 assists but 15 of them came on a fast break. That means in the half court, your ball is not moving at all. And so Keon is going to be the guy who pays for that because he's not a guy who has the ball in his hands. He's not creating for himself all that much. He's not creating for others. He's being asked to move around the perimeter and shoot three when it's open. So if we're just going to judge him on his offensive production, that's that's just not fair because he's that's not who he is. Understandable. And... And, and 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 Keith asked a great question. What has anybody done to beat Keon out? And he, Keith's one hundred percent right. I don't I don't know that anyone has. I don't know that there's a clear defining answer. But I also think you talked about. You know, I, I feel like Mike sends mixed signals with all of this, with what he wants. And the example I used was, all right, Keon starting. If you've got, if 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 we get to Thursday, and you've got, you know, two and a half three minutes left in a in a in a a plus or minus two point game with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Keon's probably not on the floor. Malik is, which means you're going with the with the four, and then you're adding Malik to that and removing Keon. 
which means you're leaning towards offense because you can make an argument either way. Man, in those final in those final three minutes, you got to get baskets. Malik's a bucket getter. Got to be able to spread the floor. Make okay, you're 100 right. Or you make the argument, hey, you need a stop. You need a guy who can get out there and get you a stop. Well, that's Keon. Mike always seems to lead towards Malik and the offensive part of that, which I feel like it's it's a constant mixed signal as to what he, exactly he expects from this team. Well, I know what he expects from this team, but what's reasonable to 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 expect when you seem to lean one way at one point in the game and a completely other way at the end of the game? Okay, so let's just carve out the last five minutes of a game, right? And so we got 43 minutes over here, and then we got this last five minutes. The last five minutes of an NBA game are completely different than the other 43 minutes. Sure. They, they just are. That's fine. The game slows down. It becomes much more half court. It becomes much more of mono we mono You don't see the pace. You don't see the transition buckets. Sure, there's a steal, and some guy gets a breakaway, and you, know, you get those on occasion. Um, but in the last five minutes of a game, De'Aaron Fox always becomes a better defender. Always. And, and Demonis Sabonis and like the rotations are crisper, but it's because the whole game is slowed down. Mm -hmm. And so when we're, we're seeing like a frenetic pace in the mid third quarter and the ball's hopping all over the place and, and we're seeing like, I don't know, 25 shot attempts in the fourth quarter, it really does slow down right at the five minute mark. And that's where it becomes such a methodical thing. And when the game becomes methodical like that, you do want your best offensive players, especially guys who can create for themselves and for others. That's who you want in the game. And so I, I've never had a huge problem with it unless you've got like one player on the other team that's just going bonkers and there's no way for you to stop them. And you have to have a stop in order to win a game. Then you go to a guy like Keon or if Keon is hitting every single three he's taken all day long, then you're like, okay, look, we'll go ahead and ride with Keon late in the game because he gives a better option to win. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think a lot of times coaches, they defer to the lineup, the closing lineup as their best five players and say, we're going to go win it with these five guys. And, you know, the defense isn't going to be as big an issue because the pace of the game is slowed down and you're not going to have these like, like super open mistakes uh, that happen throughout the the other 43 minutes. Is there a situation where I asked Casey this earlier, and, and just for the record, I do not like this idea. But, you know, a lot was made even during this preseason about um, the, the Kings being relatively small. Well, we know Kevin Herter is bigger than Keon. He's bigger than Malik. Like, is there a, a, a realistic scenario where you think we have situational starters? Like, not, obviously, we're talking about one position. We're not talking about four. Like, no, this actually makes a lot of sense for Keon to start this one. Here's how it helps De'Aaron. Here's how it helps DeMar. Here's why it makes sense versus this lineup. I mean, Golden State's probably a perfect example. We could put Keon on Steph here for 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 the bulk of these minutes, and it relieves De'Aaron for, as you just laid out, 43 minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, this matchup, Minnesota maybe being one of them, uh, maybe, maybe uh, uh, Brooklyn. Well, I don't even know what Brooklyn looks like anymore, but a bigger basketball team. Actually, this makes a lot a, a lot more sense for Kevin Herter to start in this one, and here's why. It seems ridiculous. I'm just trying to come up with an answer as to this, this position here. No, I, I think when you look at the reason why Kevin Herter would start over Keon, it's all going to become about offensive flow. If the ball is moving, the 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 court is moving in a different way. We talked about it a little bit with Mike today um, about the the gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. Like I talk about this all the time. Mike was talking about this today that the gravitational pull that not only that that Kevin Herter does, but you know actually he was talking about Doug McDermott. He's like, watch what he does. As soon as he walks on the floor, everyone starts talking hot. He's one of the hot guys. He's one of the, you know he's the hot shooter. You need to make sure that no one, that he never gets left open. That's what instantly happens when Doug McDermott steps on the floor. And, and I asked Mike, is that kind of like Kevin? And he said, exactly like Kevin. It, as soon as Kevin steps on the floor, everybody watches him run around in circles. And we all think that he's just doing laps and, and uh, like filling up the steps on a pedometer. But realistically, what he's doing is he's pulling the defense one way and another way. And just 
his ability to get hot from an area and the way that he's moving to get to there, everyone starts to lean that way. And if you can get the defense leaning just a little bit, Mm -hmm. you can take advantage of it on the other side. And, and not only that, but you can take advantage of, because if he misses a shot and everyone's leaning one way, chances are, if he's shooting a long ball, it's going to skip to the other side where you're now wide open because those guys are being unguarded because the defense is pulled. I think McDermott has that same exact draw. And, uh, you know, the fact is, like, Kevin Herter is a more functional verge version of Doug McDermott on a basketball court. Like, he has been throughout his career. He's a better assist man, um, a better rebounder. But overall, I, like, oh, he's probably even a better defender than Doug McDermott. But Doug McDermott still has that same exact, like, gravitational pull as a shooter. And I think that's one thing that frustrates me a little bit about the conversation about Kevin Herter last year is it was talked about, you know, his defense and how he, he just he just got roughed up on the defensive end on a number of occasions. And that's that, that that's it's fair. It's yeah. perfectly fair. We've talked about it on a number of occasions last year. We talked about it a lot. We were begging for him when the shot wasn't falling to get rebounds, get get, get you know, get on the floor and get a loose ball, like whatever, do something to where you're not invisible. Like it's the Harrison Barnes conversation where there were times where it felt like if Harrison wasn't scoring, he was invisible. Kevin Herter had games where he clearly wasn't invisible, even though the shot wasn't falling. But if you took everything regarding Kevin Herter's defense and kept it exactly the same, but he's averaging 13 and a half to 14 points per game, hitting 40% of his threes, none of it's a conversation. That's the part that drives me crazy because Kevin, it's not like Kevin was an all world defender the year that the Kings uh, uh, b- broke the streak the year prior. But he was hitting 40% of his threes, scoring 14 points per game. And so you looked past it a little easier. And I feel like this all boils down to whether Kevin Herter is the offensive player that he was in year one or year two. If he's the guy in year one, he can slide into the starting lineup no matter what Keon Ellis or Kevin Herter does defensively. If he's doing that offensively, I think Mike is going to take it. If he's doing what he did last year, I understand why Mike can't take it because you can't have games where he's 0 for 7 or 1 for 7 or something like that and can't give you what you need on the defensive end. You've got to have something from that position. Like, look, we can talk about offensive rating all we want. We can talk about defensive rating all we want. The only number that really matters is net rating. It's the difference between your offensive rating and your defensive rating. That's the only thing that matters. So if you're giving up let's just say 122 points a night and you're bad defensively, you're a bad defensive team, but you're scoring 132 points a a game, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't. This is uh, the argument that Rick Adelman used to fight all the time with his, when the Kings were in their glory years, Elston Turner, the same thing. It's like, if you, you want to see us be a, if you want to see the score lower in the game, we can slow it down, but what does that do? Mm-hmm. Like, as long as we're outscoring our opponent, it doesn't matter if we're outscoring them 100 to 94 or if we're outscoring them 122 to 116. It's still the same thing. The difference is the 122 to 116 is just a much prettier style of basketball. It's much more enjoyable for everyone to be part of. And there are going to be plenty of games where the Kings blow teams out using their offense because. If they get hot, there's almost no way to stop them. And that goes for the the early 2000s, and it goes for the team they have right now. This team gets hot. They can put up 140 in a game. And you're hoping you don't give up 150, because we've seen that act, and it's not great. But that's where you have to look at like all of these. The idea that Mike Brown has for a team and the idea that Monty McNair have for a team, they are pretty diametrically opposed. Like One of them wants an offensive juggernaut. One of them wants a defensive juggernaut. But at the end of the day, the way they come to a, like a a marriage here in the middle is wins. And as long as your defense is, I mean, as long as your offense and your defense, your net rating, whatever the middle of that is, is high enough. It doesn't really matter who's winning the battle. Like it's okay to be a really, really good offensive team that plays some defense. As long as you're running a plus six net rating or plus plus three net rating, and you're winning ball games. Any what's what's the most positive takeaway for you from preseason training camp from the last handful of weeks? Um, 
okay, so I think there there's subtleties, right? Uh, the biggest takeaway I have for like Keegan Murray is I watched him go up against some big dudes who tried to bully him mm -hmm. and he just used his chest and bounced him right backwards. Like I think his ability to defend up now, as opposed to defend down is like spectacular. So I'm excited to see what he looks like because we keep waiting to see what like the finished product of Keegan Murray is. Yeah. But people keep moving the goal post on that kid. Yeah. And I don't know. He's looking around like, and you guys just keep moving everything. Like there's a possibility that if some way, somehow midway through the season, the Kings acquire a, like a really, really good power forward, that Keegan Murray slides right back to the three and DeMar DeRozan slides up to the two. And here you are again, mm -hmm. asking a 24 year old third year player to completely change his game again. Yeah. So I think that that's one big thing is Keegan's ability to defend up. Uh, I would say that watching Demonis Sabonis and his lack of hesitation and everything that he's doing is so refreshing, whether it's him attacking the rim, him pulling up from 18 feet or 16 feet, him pulling up on the jump shot uh, on the three point shot. None of it. Have I seen any, any uh, like at all like hesitation? He just looks like a player who's ready to hit another gear. And I don't know if that's going to equate to him averaging more points per game or not, but I certainly think the Kings have been waiting for this moment where you, you stop seeing the wheels turning and he's such an elite player. And if he just decides to put the ball on the floor and attack the rim, just do it. Stop waiting. Stop looking at six different progressions and then finally starting to back someone down. That's not the most effective way. And I think what we've seen from him so far is just sort of like the next like version of him. And and I think again that the work that they've done in the off season, whether it's Doug and Leandro or you know whoever works with him, like again like Demar Rosen going down and spending time with him we're seeing like whatever hesitation there was in his basketball, like mindset is, is going away. And if he can carry that into the regular season for 82 games, I think he's going to be absolutely dominant. Um, I love Jordan McLaughlin's play. I didn't really know what to expect from him. Yeah. Um, when they signed him, I didn't know what to expect from him when the pre, I didn't, I was just like, all right, I'll go along with it. Uh, and he was, uh, I, I, I guess a pleasant surprise. I'm not exactly sure what to call it, but I, it's like, man, he, I, it's, he's a, he's a player. Like yeah. he's a, he's a, he's a player for this team. I totally agree. I, I think, you know, when we see him as a starter and he's got to play 24, 25 minutes, you start to see the flaws in it. Right. Because he is like maybe five eleven, uh, and, and there are some issues there, but for me, like everything that he does is just really high basketball IQ. Uh, he plays within himself. He does not make a bunch of rash decisions. Um, you know, he deflects so many passes. It's crazy. He gets a bunch of steals. I, I think he's just like, just a really smart basketball player. And for teams like the Kings, like you can't just have like mm. a whole entire stacked roster of like, of unless you're the Boston Celtics, you can't have all-stars at every position. Mm -hmm. So what you need is guys who come in, they know their role and they do their role to the best of, of their ability. And I think Trey Lyles is one of those guys. And I think that Jordan, I'm going to put in the same sort of bucket where don't worry if he's averaging six points a game or whatever, look at the intangibles, look at like, again, deflections, look at uh, assist to turnover ratio, look at his, uh, his offensive and defensive ratings, because it sure does look like he's a winning basketball player. And that's, Again, you need to accumulate as many of these high basketball IQ players that impact winning. And early on, uh, that's certainly what I've seen from him. Did you get a chance to read uh, Sam's uh, article today over for the New yeah. York Times slash Athletic? Um, anything, anything to make of that De'Aaron quote about making sure the Kings are in the right position? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, this is always going to be about uh, like number one money, uh, and mm -hmm. number two, it's going to be about like, you have to show that you're continually, continuously growing. And I, I made this point with Kyle earlier today, like DeMar DeRozan is only under contract for like a guaranteed contract for two years. Those are the same two years that De'Aaron Fox is under contract. Like the Kings need to show that they can 
not just build a uh, like playoff caliber team, but they need to show that they can take the next step. And whether that's, again, Fox and Sabonis taking this leap, Keegan Murray taking a leap with them, Malik Monk taking that leap with them, and they become like this elite group that can make make themselves into title contenders, or that means that they've got to go out and get somebody else, um, you can kind of see where where De'Aaron's head is, that he would love to be, you know, again, he 72 games away from being the all-time leader in games played in Sacramento Kings in the Sacramento era. Wow. He's uh, 72 games behind uh, Jason Thompson. Uh, yeah, so he needs 70. Jason Tom- Thompson leads so many franchise has so many franchise records. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. So if he hits uh, game 73 this season, he becomes the all-time leader in games played. He would like to play here his whole career. His family's like established themselves here, but it has to. We have to start seeing like his play and it has to translate to something more Mm. like the fact that he is missing all NBA and he's not getting an all-star bid because he plays in Sacramento. um, To me, it just, it doesn't feel good for anybody and especially for him, you know, you made it one time and even the one time I believe he was an injury replacement the first time he made the all-star team. And, and so you're still waiting for like, Hey man, you know, we talked about it. Top 19 guys of the top 19 yep. scorers in the league, 18 of them were in the all-star game. Yep. And he's the one guy who's not. Yep. And you're like, you're looking around like, hey, what did I do wrong? He finished eight in the league in scoring. He scored, he averaged more than Anthony Edwards. He averaged more than Steph Curry. Damian Lillard crushed him. Like all of these players, he's uh, Maxi. He averaged more points per game. So if we're going to look at that as, as the benchmark, because it is for who makes the all-star team who scores the most makes the all-star team. And then you're going to leave one guy out. It doesn't feel good. And and you can look around the league and say, okay, why? Well, you know, it's almost like he was punished for scoring 30 points per game for like the first two months of the season. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, you would have been better off spreading it out, buddy. Like, yeah, you just scored too many points too quick. Yep. And then it tapered off a little bit. And all of a sudden, of course, you know, the Kings weren't the best, but they were far from a bad basketball team. They were better than the Golden State Warriors at the time. Yeah. Uh, which was certainly frustrating. And then uh, Domas having the season he was having uh, didn't get the acknowledgement either the second year, at least. Yeah. He was asked about it today and said, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and have a discussion about my, my contract status moving forward. But you know, like, yeah, I'd want to be here. Like mm-hmm. uh, that's what I gathered from it. And then I also, I look at the uh, Demona Sabonis quote in that, and it's the same thing he told us at his basketball camp where they were getting frustrated. He was getting frustrated by the almost. Yeah. The, you know, we yep. almost got this guy. We almost got that guy and we missed. Yep. I think they're done with that. Like, go get that, go get us a player that uh, we don't want to talk about anymore. Just go get the guy. Like if, if that's what it takes, that's, you know, we're, we're tired of hearing we almost landed this player or we're so close. Like it, that's not going to cut it from here on out. Like those guys want to win and they know that they need, they need really good players in order to win and other teams are able to close these deals. Why not us? And that's uh it's an interesting dynamic, but you know, look, look, I don't blame Fox at all. Yeah, I don't either. Um, 49ers or chiefs. It's your, it's your Patrick. Ma- it's, your, it's your, it's your, it's your favorite team versus your, your man crush. <sighs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, we're gonna have to see. Uh, I, I hate seeing the the Chiefs after a bye week, um, but they also read after a bye week. Yeah, they aren't getting in. The Chiefs aren't. They didn't add any wide receivers, and they still don't have any. So, just think of Patrick Mahomes. And they're still and, five and zero. Oh. The Forty ers offense. <laughs> well, Jawan Jennings is out. Ricky Pearsall is a full go. Ricky Pearsall is going to play no matter how big of a curmudgeon uh, Kyle Matson is. Ricky Pearsall is playing. He's going to catch one touchdown. It's going to be the, the greatest story since that fake movie, Rudy. And uh, Kyle's going to be mad all of Monday about it. Uh, is amazing. our show over? Is it over? It got is. 30 seconds. Right. 30 seconds. Well, we appreciate y'all so much for being with us. 